Hello to everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to cover political executives and their leadership. This is found in chapter 13 of your online textbook. Now, in thinking about the role of the executive, the role that the executive plays, uh, we can utilize an understanding of the three branches of government. Uh, now, government systems around the world may not have uh, the same exact system as the United States, but what we find as political scientists is that uh, different states or countries will have some government body composed of a legislature, an executive, and judiciary. They may have different titles such as assembly or cabinet, things like that, but we can see them uh, take a variety of responsibilities. Legislatures are the ones who create laws. They decide what the law is in practice. Executives implement the law and make sure that the law is being carried out, that it's being followed. Think if the legislative branch makes up a law regarding environmental protection. Executives are the ones who oversee and enforce the law and punish those who are found in violation of the law. Judiciaries interpret the law, and we'll talk about legislatures and judiciaries in later chapters, but these uh, all rely on, the law relies on someone implementing it. And in this case, we're going to focus on the executives who do. So what are the functions of the political executives? Well, let's take a look. Uh, we can look at our example of the United States President Donald Trump and the Queen of England to see how both figures serve as ceremonial heads of state. We can call the head of state and the chief executive as having a ceremonial role or symbolic role in the leadership of a country. And so typically you'll see presidents meet other dignitaries. You'll see presidents, queens make appearances in dire times or uh, try to assist. They represent the country in a number of ways and perhaps the head of state role is to be that figurehead, to be the representative who speaks for the people. They represent the society at large. And this role as ceremonial leader is formal. It's ceremonial. It is something that we can expect the president or the queen to make commencement addresses, to appoint certain, uh, to give awards, things like that. Um, but there is another type of political executive, and we can think of the head of government. Now, what's interesting about the United States is that the president serves as both head of state and the head of government. In England, or the United Kingdom, the queen serves as the head of state while the, the head of government is uh, served by a different figure, the prime minister. And so when it comes to policy-making leadership, we can think of Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom. This figure directs and controls the policy progress, uh, process. They implement the law, they guide members of parliament or Congress to get their will done. The executive is the one who is expected to govern, to manage the affairs of the state, to implement the laws uh, at times, and use force if needed. The president of the United States, as alluded to, also serves as head of government. Here is the president signing a bill passed by Congress into law, and so the president uh, by signing this law, it becomes official, and they will also have other official responsibilities. Another function of the political executive is to provide popular leadership. When we think about the political executive, such as the president or prime minister, the popularity of these figures is crucial to the stability of the regime as a whole. If an executive is unpopular, we can see that this may erode trust in the government and that can lead to some problems come election time and also for members of Congress to get what the president or prime minister wants to be passed into law. When it comes to bureaucratic leadership, we expect the political executive to have major bureaucratic and administrative responsibilities. And so when we think of the cabinet in the United States, for example, as part of the federal bureaucracy, the president oversees millions of employees, and the president oversees directly, has a hands-on role with those cabinet officials. Think of the Secretary of State, the Secretary of the Treasury, of Energy, and more. 
Now, we also expect the executive to take the role of crisis leadership. When a crisis breaks out, the executive responds by virtue of the hierarchical structure. Uh, what we mean by this is that in a moment of crisis, uh, even the works of the Federalist Papers recognize that an executive, a single official, uh, who can take a look at the landscape as a whole and make swift decisions is part of the job itself. We don't expect the legislative branch or the judicial branch to act swiftly on policy and help guide the people. No, we look to the executive first because the nature of the job allows them to take in great deals of information and make swift decisions. So there are a number of roles of the political executive. Now, who becomes a political executive or who leads? That's a different question altogether. Uh, it has been explored or assessed that there are three dimensions of power that shape the influence of presidents, prime ministers, and their cabinets. There's the formal dimension of power in which the executive has established constitutional roles and responsibilities. There is the informal dimension of power in which the role of the personality, political skills and experience, and the impact factors, impact of factors such as parties and the media take hold. So let's just focus on the difference between formal and informal. Take, for example, the President of the United States. If the President wants to deploy the troops anywhere around the world, the Constitution has established that that is a role the President uh, has. So if the President gives an order to the United States military, they are bound to follow it by the Constitution. When we talk about the informal dimension of power, we can see that as having the ability to sway public opinion or to pressure members of Congress to pass his or her preferred legislation. And this informal dimension of power, it is to be recognized that political executives are typically most visible to the public. The public may not know their individual member of Congress or parliament, but they will know who is in charge, who is the executive, who is leading. And if the public is sympathetic to that informal dimension of power, uh, then we can see that through their experience, uh, they can uh, utilize that in a number of ways to get things done. Now, keep in mind with the informal dimension of power, uh, we're talking about the ability to get things done. This is different from the external dimension of power which is the political, economic, and diplomatic context. There are a number of factors that affect the success of the executive. There are political ramifications, such as scandals within a political party, uh, have, uh, popular challengers to the office. There's economic developments. Political executives are often responsible, seen as responsible for the economic well-being of a country. However, executives don't have a strong uh, hold of what the economy does. That's something to consider. And the diplomatic context, the success of the executive can be boosted by whether or not countries at war or at peace with rival nations. This is something to consider. Now, when focusing on presidents, presidents are the chief executive of any presidential system. In a presidential system, the executive and the legislature are elected separately. There is a formal separation of power between the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judicial branch. In a presidential system, the executive cannot be removed by the legislature unless it's through measures like impeachment. So what this means Think about just a normal way of removing the president of the United States. If they haven't done anything wrong, the only way to remove a president is if they are termed out of office, meaning they've served two years in the United States, or they are voted out by uh, the voters. However, in other countries, when we come to the parliaments, we'll explore how executives can be removed by the legislature in normal fashion, but that is not true of the presidential system. So here was that exception I discussed, impeachment. Uh, basically, if the president has done something wrong, then the legislative branch may have some grounds to remove that person from office. Uh, number four, the executive cannot dissolve the legislature. When we talk about dissolve, we mean uh, basically call for new elections on the spot. 
In the United States, our presidential system, we have mem- legislative elections every two Every two years, we elect every member of the House of Representatives and several senators along the way. The president if, is bound to the will of these different legislative bodies. In parliamentary systems, the executive can dissolve the legislature. They can call for new elections to try to get more members of their preferred party uh, to get elected. Number five, authority is often concentrated in the hands of the president. President of the United States, for example, has massive uh, priority in getting his or her will done, uh, getting things accomplished through the use of executive orders, directing members of the federal bureaucracy to get things done. This is different from prime ministers or, in the case of Germany and other countries, chancellors. Parliamentary executives, prime ministers or chancellors, have three essential features. Number one, what makes a parliamentary executive a parliamentary executive is that it is typically associated with a separate head of state, like a constitutional monarch. Think of the Queen of England for, that we discussed in the earlier slide. The Queen of England serves as the separate head of state, and the parliamentary executives are serving as the head of government. Now, these parliamentary executives are elected from the assembly. What will happen is that voters will select members of the assembly or legislature, parliament. And the parliament will then go on to elect the prime minister. And these prime ministers or chancellors are accountable to the assembly. They have to keep the assembly satisfied by passing what a majority would want. And so in a parliamentary system, Uh, The executives there survive in government only as long as it retains the confidence of the assembly. And if members of the assembly call for a vote of no confidence, what they're trying to do is remove that executive from power. Prime ministers are the heads of government, as discussed with having a separate head of state, ceremonial figurehead. Prime ministers, they're the ones crafting, implementing legislation, signing things into law, committing oversight, and more. And power of the prime minister is derived from the leadership of the majority party or a coalition of parties, in case no one party has an outright majority. Prime ministers typically are associated with parliamentary systems. Parliamentary systems typically have multi-party systems, where multiple parties can compete and have a viable chance of success in their structure. If no one party, let's say there's hypothetically 10 parties, if no one of them has a majority or the the most number of seats in power, a coalition can be formed of parties with similar goals and preferences. So let's use the United Kingdom's parliament as an example. Uh, We can see that the conservatives, this is as of 2019, they had a Uh, an overwhelming lead. They had close to a majority. Uh, But notice, close is not exactly a complete majority. Uh, If we divide the 650 seats, we'll find that half would be 325. In order to have a majority, you need 326 votes. But notice the Conservative Party, even though they are the most dominant party, they do not have an outright majority by themselves. But Thanks to building a coalition of support to support things like an agreement, for example, we can look at the Northern Ireland Democratic Unionist. This is a separate political party which has supported this agreement. Notice by building this coalition of support, adding these 10 members of the parliament gives this party and these two parties the ability to get things done, to pass uh, things into law. And so coalition building is one of the tasks of the prime minister. Notice this is very different from a two-party system. In a two-party system, we would just say whoever has the most seats in power, they they get the majority uh, most of the time. But in parliaments, majorities are hard to come by. And so coalitions will typically be built of one or more parties together. And so that is something to consider. The, The second most powerful group here is the Labour Party, but notice they have just 256. They would need at least 75 more uh, members of Parliament to go along with them. The Green Party has just one member of Parliament, and notice this person 
may build a coalition of support to help get things done if they view these uh, other parties as having similar goals. This one person could be the swing vote, so to speak. And so the party makeup is going to make things very different. And so, so long as this majority coalition uh, supports the will of the prime minister, currently Boris Johnson, we can see that they're going to be able to get things done. Now let's focus on uh, political executive cabinets. Virtually all political executives feature a cabinet, and cabinets enable government to present a collective face to not only the assembly, but to the public as well. And so what this means is we can think of the presidential cabinet, where we have a secretary of defense, a secretary of agriculture, secretary of homeland security. These officials are appointed by the president, and the president has the power to fire these individuals. And so uh, the president often can use the threat of firing to accomplish many of his uh, preferred policy goals. Uh, cabinets are also designed to ensure the effective coordination of government policy. And so since all members of the cabinet are typically responsible to the will of the president, they will try to get things done in the way that the president has coordinated. So going back to the many cabinet positions in the United States, excluding the vice president, we see the secretary of treasury, defense, the attorney general, the secretary of in the interior, which handles the national parks in the United States, and many more. All of the heads of these departments make up the various officials in the cabinet. So the Secretary of Labor, for example, is appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and they are responsible. They are subject to the will of the president because if the president doesn't like the job the Secretary of Labor is doing, well, they can fire that person and appoint someone else. And so this is going to lead to a streamlined ability of the executive branch to get things done. So long as the president is satisfied, uh, everyone knows their role, then things will get done. And if the president is no longer satisfied with any one of these members except the vice president, the, the president can remove these officials. Uh, we can look at the president, the current president, Trump. His cabinet uh, was originally comprised of many figures, President Obama, uh, President George W. Bush. All of these officials uh, were responsible to the president. They all try to do the job the president has set them out to do. And if the president is dissatisfied or if there's disagreement among the cabinet members, these officials can either resign or they can be removed from office. And so what's unique about President Trump in his first term is that many of these officials pictured here have already departed. Nonetheless, it is by virtue of the office of the president to oversee all these officials and they have direct input over them. And we can see Canadian uh, uh, Prime Minister Justin, uh, I'm sorry, Canadian President Justin Trudeau. Uh, he is uh, surrounded here by members of his cabinet and these officials go out and carry the office, uh, the official business of the executive branch. Now one last thing uh, as part of this chapter, let's go over an application to how political scientists uh, using the perspective of rational choice theory, would view something like the presidential veto. Now, this next part of the lecture is fun. It's a good brain exercise. It maybe tells us a little bit about the world, uh, but it has some limitations that we'll talk about as well. So let's begin. You recall rational choice theory, uh, one of its major tenets is it assumes that people have self-interest that they have individual ideas of what is right and what is wrong. And so rational choice theory suggests that these individuals have their preferences and then they will figure out how to get their preferences into action. When it comes to the presidential veto, we see that the president is responsible for getting a lot of things done. So let's play the game called the veto game. So what are the goals of this thought experiment or game as presented by rational choice theorists? Uh, it's to help us understand when vetoes are used and how the veto confers influence. Because if the president, if their job is to sign legislation, then why would we ever expect to see vetoes? If the president's job is to pass things into law, well, we can see that the veto allows the president to have some influence over the entire legislative branch because even though the legislative branch is their own distinct separate branch, 
they are bound by the will of the president in many ways, thanks to the veto power. So to play this game, we're going to have a bit of a key here to help us explore in future slides. And whenever you see a C, just imagine that that's Congress, Congress's favorite bill, the thing they would like to get passed. Whenever you see the letter P, this is the president's preferred bill or favorite bill. This is whatever the president wants, basically. When you see a SQ, that stands for status quo. This represents whatever policy is in place at current. So let's take, for example, uh, the tax rate as it is right now. Let's say Congress wants to raise taxes, but the president wants to lower taxes. Uh, status quo is whatever uh, is happening right now. So it's basically a way to keep things the same. And then whenever you see this B, it is the proposed bill. It is what is one proposal by either members of Congress, uh, and we'll see how this can be affected. So let's take some assumptions. Let's think, let's put ourselves in the mindset of a president. Let's imagine you were president and you had some preferences. Now, what I love about rational choice theory is you can boil it down to things that'll make the president happy, very happy, happy, okay with, or sad. And when we think about some assumptions here, let's assume that the president has a preference on the amount of dollars spent on the national defense. Let's say the president sees a bill. If the president were to receive a bill uh, that allowed for $500 billion, $550 billion in government spending on the national defense, let's say that would make the president very sad. And if the president is sad, is the president going to be willing to pass this piece of legislation? Probably not. But notice, as the defense spending becomes more and more significant, this increases the happiness level of the president. And so the president's preferred goal we can assess is to have a defense budget of around $700 billion. But notice, over time, the president may become less excited when bills become even more expensive. So let's say members of Congress were to propose an $850 billion defense spending bill. We could imagine this could make this president sad for a number of reasons. Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's a, the president views it as a waste of tax paying dollars. Nonetheless, if the president has a preference, members of Congress are going to be willing to react to what the president wants. So in the veto game, let's imagine the president first uh, the first scenario is that the president and Congress prefer the exact same bill. What will happen if the president and Congress prefers the exact same policy? Well, number one, Congress will pass the bill, their preferred bill, and the president mo will most likely sign it because if both Congress and the president prefer the specific bill on the president's desk, then there's going to be no problem. And the veto game is a success. We see this is one resolution to passing a bill. But what if the president and Congress disagree about a change in the status quo? What if there is something that Congress wants to change and the president doesn't want to change it in the same way? What then? So let's use environmental regulation as an example. Recall our legend C stands for Congress, P stands for president, and SQ stands for status quo. So let's say the president prefers less environmental regulation. Uh, maybe the president prefers this for a number of reasons. Maybe uh, to gain the trust of influential lobbyists and other private business owners. Maybe the president views environmental regulation as a stifle, uh, as a, having a stifling effect on the economy, having the health and the growth capacity of a good economy. And let's say the status quo is somewhere in the middle, where the status quo is to have uh, some environmental regulation, but more than what the president wants and less than what Congress wants. Because Congress, let's hypothetically say, if they want uh, more environmental regulation, notice this is much more than what the president wants, and it's a lot more than what the status quo is. So if we were to play this game out, seeing what the president wants versus what Congress wants, where do you think this bill will, will follow? Because let's say hypothetically Congress passes this bill. Congress has made some concessions. Congress has said, we won't have every one of our regulations, but we got to have some. Will the president veto this bill, this proposed bill? Well, let's look at the evidence. We know the president prefers less environmental regulation. 
We know the status quo, what is already in place. The president probably doesn't like that already. And to add more environmental regulations, even though it's less than what Congress would want to have, it is still much more than what the president would want. We could assume that the president will veto this specific bill. That even though the president dislikes the status quo, if the president signs this bill into law, then that can be a more dramatic change, meaning more environmental regulation that the president simply would not like. So we can expect the president will veto this bill. Let's do another scenario. Let's say in this scenario, uh, both the president and status quo are in the same side. The president uh, wants a little bit more uh, clean air laws than what is already presently passed. And let's say Congress wants much, much more than what the president wants. Here we see this bill has been passed by Congress. Even though it's less than what they wanted, they're trying to concede some, uh, give some concessions to the president to make sure it's passable. It's still much more than what the president would want because the president sees that the status quo, it, it's somewhat beneficial. Uh, the president may have a threshold, however. Even, the president, even though the president would want more clean air laws than what's already passed, we can see there's a limit. That over time, having more regulations may be a problem for the president. And so we could say that if this bill were proposed, would the president sign it? If it's outside of his comfort zone, so to speak? Probably not. Let's do another scenario, uh, but just slightly moving the bill uh, in the direction of the president. Let's say Congress, even though they want a lot of clean air laws, much more than what the president wants, let's say they pass a bill that they think the president will be willing to sign, something within the president's comfort zone. If we look at this bill, finally, we can see that the president would be likely, uh, more likely to support this bill because it's closer to his preferred uh, bill than not. And even though this is more clean air laws than what the president would want, it is he, the president does desire a change in the status quo, and if he has to accept more clean air laws to get it, the president will likely do so. We see that, notice, we're not talking about President Trump or President Obama or any future president. We're just getting into the minds of preference and interests. How do these officials, like the political executive, get things done? Uh, well, let's take a look at one more scenario. When looking at the veto game, we can see scenario three shows us that the same side of the status quo and the president uh, Congress is on the same side of the status quo, and the president prefers a lot of change, a lot more change than what the status quo. And so let's say the president de desires an increase in defense spending. Congress, they want more money spent on defense, but not as much as the president. What's going to happen when they propose this bill? Well, depending on what the, con the, the comfort level of the president is, we could say, will this bill be passed? Chances are, actually, yes. Because the president has a moment, even though it's not exactly what they, they would want to pass, it's not the amount of defense spending they would like, it, this is still better than nothing. Because if the president rejects this bill, he's left with the status quo, and this is much less, uh, this, is, this would make his interests worse off than what his preferences would be. So we could see that this can lead to scenarios in which even though the president has made a campaign promise or said something that indicates they want to increase and have a massive increase in defense spending, uh, the president may have to concede or compromise on his beliefs in order to get things done. Uh, let's take another scenario. Let's talk about defense spending. Uh, I'm sorry, we already did that. Notice, even though Congress is willing to support it, uh, we can see that the president uh, will likely sign this bill because it's a bigger change. It's a change. It's not as big as the change that the president would want, but by vetoing this bill, the status quo would be uh, less uh, desirable for the president's interests. So how does the president get things done? Well, the president will often make threats of a veto. Uh, effective veto threats uh, are most effective when they are credible, meaning the president will likely stick to his word, they are explicit or clear because it's one thing for the president to be vague about it, to say, yeah, I want to get this done, but, you know, I'll let you guys decide, figure it out. No, when a president is clear in what they want, members of Congress then see a path forward. 
And finally, public, because when the president makes their desires known, well, members of the public, and by proxy, uh, the members of Congress who are elected by the public, they will have to be responsive to the will of the president. So since power is achieved through anticipation, a president can influence legislation without using his veto. If the president is clear, credible, and goes public with his desires, we can see that this official will be able to use the threat of the veto to push Congress closer to his desired preference, his or her desired preference. And so we can see that there are times in which even though a president does not use their veto power very often, if they are using the threat of the veto, they will accomplish, uh, they will push the hand of Congress to pass bills that they will be closer to their desired viewpoints. So why do we see any vetoes? Why, why if we know this as rational choice theories, theorists, why doesn't Congress just see what the president wants and then get it done? Well, there's a number of reasons. By looking at the effects of this uh, veto game, this game theory, we can see that there are four reasons presented for why we see vetoes. Now, let's, let's say number one. Let's say Congress doesn't know what the president feels about a proposed bill. If the Congress is uncertain of what the president's ideal point is, then they are just operating blindly and waiting for the president to deliver remarks uh, or sign or veto this bill. Number two, let's say a president may dislike a popular bill so much that he is willing to veto it and suffer a decline in his approval. Remember, even though the president is elected by the people, uh, they are somewhat sheltered from public opinion. And so even though a president makes a, uh, a veto that's in that's opposed to the interest of what the public wants, the president, keep in mind, they're elected, they're in power, and they can have the ability to use that uh, power, even if it costs them a few points in popularity. Let's say number three, Congress may think it has the votes for an override. In the United States system, Congress can override the presidential veto with a two-thirds supermajority. However, this is very rare. This was only done uh, 10 times, about 10 times, in the past decade or so. So that's not a very high batting average. Um, number four, Congress may pass bills that it knows the president will veto. And you may be asking, why would Congress ever do that? Well, keep in mind when we factor in uh, idea number two, maybe Congress wants to pass a bill that they know the president doesn't like because they know that the public likes it. And so Congress and the president may be locked in a game, so to speak, over what they can do to increase their preferred preferences. If they hit the popularity of the president, the voters may elect a new president who will meet the demands of Congress. If the president uh, is willing to do so to suffer, uh, is willing to veto in order uh, to get his or her preference. So some empirical results we can draw from this is if you look at studies on Congress and the president, uh, in times of divided government, veto threats are the most frequent. Uh, so we can think of what's happened since 2018 when the House took was controlled by Democrats and the Senate was controlled by Republicans. Once the House uh, majority became Democratic, they began to pass bills that the president didn't want, trying to force the president's hand, even at the expense of the popularity of the president. Now notice, this is what they campaigned on. So even though you may personally disagree with it or agree with it, nonetheless, they are responding to different constituencies. Um, absent a threat, let's say there's no threat. Let's say the president has uh, a lot of important issues they care about and then the rest they'll just say, whatever Congress wants, I don't care. Well, when that happens, vetoes we can expect are rare. We can also study and see that threats do bring concessions. Threats do have the ability to make members of Congress concede on certain viewpoints. Keep in mind, Democrats have been in power in the majority in the House since 2018, and they haven't had every one of their bills passed. Neither has uh, members of the Senate got everything they wanted to do done as well. The threat of the veto will bring concessions a lot of the time. And finally, by giving these concessions, by making uh, men's to try to pass certain things that the president wants, concessions can deter vetoes. So 
we can see the veto game as having some significant effect on showing us uh, just why vetoes are used and the, how the veto confers influence. Recall, there are formal powers. The president has the formal power to veto, but the informal power is the ability to get things done. And one of the ways to do that is to the power of influence by putting their stamp, by making th uh, threats of a veto uh, known credibly and publicly. Now, we can think of the veto game as just one specific scenario, but there's many ways to think about the political executive. Uh, we've gone over some categories, some types, um, and that's where we'll pause for today on this chapter. Okay, so thanks for watching. Uh, go ahead and post your discussion comments. I'm looking forward to reading them. And if you have any questions, just send me a message on Canvas, and I'll be glad to help. Take care.